Welcome to Daily News Analysis of Shankarai's Academy. Today's date is 27th September 2024. Today's topic of discussion is first, Karnataka government withdraws general consent to the CBI to conduct the probe. So, this news article is taken from the Hindu page 1. So, here we will be discussing about the general consent and what CBI is from the prelims perspective. And second news article is taken from the newspaper Live Mint. Here we will discuss about the hybrid vehicles and the electric vehicles. We will also see what are the steps taken by the government to promote the electrical vehicles to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions in the environment. And the third article is taken from the newspaper Indian Express. And here we will be discussing about the AQI which is the air quality index from the prelims perspective. So, without further delay, let us get into today's discussion. Look at this news article taken from the Hindu newspaper page 1. So, this news article is about the withdrawal of general consent to the CBI by the Karnataka state government. So, in this discussion, we will see about the CBI which is the Central Bureau of Investigation detailly from the prelims perspective. You will also see what general concern means. So, let us see about the CBI first. So, this was founded in the year 1963 through an executive order. So, this executive order is based on the recommendation from a committee called as the Santanam Committee for the Prevention of Corruption. So, here the key word is the Santanam Committee and the 1963. The CBI will derive the power from an act called as the Delhi Special Police Establishment Act of 1946. Here you can see the CBI is getting power from an act and not a constitutional provision. So, it is called as a statutory body and not a constitutional body. Note that the CBI has to get the consent or permission from the concerned state government to investigate within the states. So, you may wonder why is it so? Because the police which is a law enforcement in authority in the state is coming under the state list under the schedule 7 of the Indian constitution. As the jurisdiction is overlapping with the state subject, they have to get the consent from the concerned state government to conduct the investigation. So, this is the reason why CB has to get the consent from the concerned state government to conduct their investigation. So, they need not get the concern from the state government if they are directed by the courts. So, two ways in which they can conduct the investigation is one with the assistance of the court and two with the help of the concerned state government. Here the consent is of two types. One is the general consent and another is the special consent. General consent is nothing but once the permission is granted, they need not take the permission for each and every cases. So, this will reduce the time delay for the investigation. And another type of consent is the special consent. Here, they have to get the permission for each and every case to conduct the investigation. Note that the CBI comes under the Ministry of Personal Public Grievances and Pensions under the specific department called as the Department of Person and the Training. So, please make note of the ministry as they may confuse this part in the prelims question. So, what is the power of the CBI? They have the power to investigate the corruption, economic offences, special crimes such as the murder or terrorism. They also investigate high profile cases. As already discussed, they have to get the concern from the concerned state government to conduct the investigation within that jurisdiction. But it is not so when the court directs them. So, this power is given to the Supreme Court or the High Court under the Article 142. So, what is this Article 142? So, the Supreme Court has the power to order in some cases to ensure complete justice to the people. So, if there is any law which does not cover the ordinary situation, the Supreme Court can step in an order to ensure complete and fair justice to the people. So, this is called as the Article 142. And now, the CBA can also conduct criminal investigation under the law such as the Indian Penal Court and the Prevention of Corruption Act. These are the powers of the CBA. Now, talking about the functions of the CBA, the first function is to prevent the corruption, that is anti-corruption. 
they can investigate in corruption as well as bribery in case of the central government, public sector undertakings and the nationalized banks. They also conduct investigation in some serious crimes such as the terrorism, organized crimes, bomb blast and the cyber crime. So, cyber crime is nothing but any illegal activity which involves the usage of digital devices. This is called as the cyber crime. So, they will investigate any cases related to the cyber crime as well. And the third function of the CBI is to investigate fraud, financial scams, illegal transactions and money laundering cases. And the main function of the CBI is to investigate interstate crimes with the central government authorization. They also represent India in any case of extradition and mutual legal assistance cases. So, what is extradition? Extradition is nothing but where suppose there are two countries, countries 1 and countries 2. It is a legal handover of accused or convicted criminal from one country to another. So, this country might require this convicted criminal to conduct the trial. So, this process is called as the extradition. In this case of extradition, the CBI will represent India. This is given in this point. Talking about the staffing, they include officers from the IPS, also recruitments done to the through the UPSC, which is the Union Public Service Commission. They also include technical and legal experts in them. The director of this CBI is appointed by a high level committee and this committee consists of Prime Minister, the leader of opposition and the Chief Justice of India. If Chief Justice of India is not the member, he will appoint or nominate a member from the Supreme Court judge. This is the composition of the high level committee who will appoint the CBI director. So, along with that, you have to note that there are many divisions of CBI such as the Anti-Corruption Division, Economic Offence Division, the Special Crime Division and the Legal and Research Division. So, these are the divisions of the CBI. So, having discussed about the staffing, what are the functions of CBI, now we will see what are the challenges faced by them. First is the state consent issues. We already saw that they have to get the consent from the or permission from the particular state government to conduct the investigation. So, this can limit their jurisdiction on which they can act. So, we can take the example of Karnataka and West Bengal for this perspective. Next is the political interference. So, the CBA can be allegedly misused by some ruling government against the leader of opposition as well as to shield their own people. So, this is raising a question on the autonomy of the CBA. There is also a shortage of staffs in the CBI. This can affect the quality of the investigation as well as the time delay in the investigation. So, you have to also know that there is a resource constraint in case of CBI. So, this can also delay the investigation and the prosecution process. As already said, there is an overlap of jurisdiction in case of the CBI and the police. So, this can lead to the friction between the local police as well as the CBI. And lastly, they are dependent on the Department of Personal and Training for their financial resources and they do not in have any financial autonomy. So, this is also raising concerns about the functional autonomy of the CBI. So, until now we saw what are the functions and what are the staffing and challenges of the CBI. With this knowledge in mind, let us see a prelims practice question. With reference to CBI, consider the following statements. Central government can authorize the CBI to investigate a crime in state, but only with the consent of concerned state government. So, this statement is right, which we discussed in the earlier slides. And the second statement is, CBI is under the administrative control of Ministry of Home Affairs. So, this statement is wrong. It is under the Ministry of Personal, Public Grievance and Pension. So, this option would be wrong and the correct answer will be one only. So, with this, we will conclude the discussion on this article and now let us move on to the next one. Look at this news article taken from the newspaper Indian Express. So, this news article says that the air quality in the Delhi has improved from the poor to a satisfactory status in the AQI which is the air quality index. So, on this backdrop, we have to understand about the AQI which comes under the environment subject of the prelims. So, let us have a clear understanding about the AQI from the prelims perspective. 
So, this AQI provides the real time information about the air quality. So, this will help the citizens to understand how clean or how polluted the environment, particularly the air pollution, is. So, you, this the air quality index consists of almost six categories, which is good, satisfactory, moderately polluted, poor, very poor, and severe. So, this good has a range of about 0 to 50. So, if it is 0 to 50, it is an acceptable and a good air quality level and it does not have any health impact. So, the satisfactory level comes under the range of 51 to 100. Here, it is acceptable air quality level, but it has impact on individuals who are sensitive such as one with respiratory disorders and so on. Here you have to note that both these categories have a range of about 50 that is 0 to 50 and 51 to 100 and all these four categories have a range of about 100 that is they have 101 to 200, 201 to 300 and so on. So, with each category the health risk will increase. The severe category is the most emergency air quality situation. So, what is the use of these quality index? It will help us to understand the impact of the air pollution and also what precaution we have to take to deal with this situation. So, we have a national regulatory body called as the CPCB which is the Central Pollution Control Board who will monitor these air pollutes pollutants such as the particulate matter 10, particulate matter 2.5, NO2, SO2, carbon monoxide, ozone, ammonia and the lead. So, here you have to note that only carbon monoxide is there in the list and not carbon dioxide. So, this can be confused in case of the prelims question. Please make note of all these pollutants as this might pop up in the prelims question such as which of the following pollutants are in the air quality index. So, now we have to also note that this central pollution control board is monitoring this pollutants under a program called as the national air quality monitoring program. So, what is the source of this AQI data? So, they will receive the data from the air quality monitoring stations which are situated across the India. So, the information regarding the air pollution is present in websites such as the Ministry of Environmental, Forest and Climate Change as well as the Central Pollution Control Board. So, now we will have a quick brush up about the Central Pollution Control Board. So, this Central Pollution Control Board was established in the year 1974 under an act called as the Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1974. So, it was established under this act, but it derives the power from an act called as the Air Prevention and Control of Pollution Act. So, this is the act from which they derive the power. The main function of this is to control as well as prevent the air and water pollution. They are also responsible to monitor the air pollutants we enlisted in the last slide. Another important function of this CPCB is that they will implement a program or a plan called as the GRAP, which is the Graded Response Action Plan. So, this plan is a comprehensive framework to address the air pollution. So, this is particularly in the region of National Capital Region of Delhi. So, this Graded Response Action Plan consists of almost four categories such as Moderate to Poor, Very Poor, Severe and Emergency. So, based on the categories, they will have a predefined directives which we have to take based on the air quality index levels. They have sector specific directives such as in the case of construction. So, construction generates high amount of pollution. So, if the category is in severe pollution category, they can take dust control measures. They can also halt the construction if the pollution level is very severe. And in case of industries, they can insist them to shift to a cleaner fuel such as the renewable energy in, in place of fossil fuels. We can also shut down the industries in case of emergencies. And lastly, in case of vehicle which contributes a lot of emission into the environment, we can promote the public transports, we can restrict the transportation of heavy vehicles, 
we can also implement strategies such as the odd and even scheme this is nothing but on one day vehicles with the register number ending with odd number will go and another day the even number will go this is called as the odd and even scheme so in this discussion we saw what is aqi and what are the pollutants monitor under it and we also saw about the central pollution control board functions and lastly we completed with the grap which is the graded response action plan which is implemented by the central pollution control board to address the air pollution so with this knowledge in mind let's see a prelims practice question which of the following pollutants is not measured in the india's air quality index particulate matter 2.5 we already saw this is in the list co2 i mentioned already in the discussions that only co that is carbon monoxide is in the list of air quality index and not co2 and ozone and ammonia are in the list of air quality index so the correct answer would be co2 which is not measured in the air quality index so with this we'll conclude the discussion on this article and now let's move on to the next one look at this news article taken from the newspaper live mint so this article is written by an iit madras professor so he is raising the concern about the incentives which are given to the hybrid vehicles in par with the electric vehicles so he says that this can slow down the global efforts which are taken to reduce the greenhouse gas emission and the climate action plan so on this backdrop let's try to understand about the electric vehicles and what are hybrid vehicles and what are the plug in vehicles that is the plug in electric vehicles and we will also see what is green washing with respect to this what are the steps taken by the government to promote the electrical vehicles in india so let's get into the discussion so electric vehicles are nothing but vehicles which are battery powered electric motors so they consist of battery powered electric motors and the source for this battery is actually electricity so this electricity can be derived from fossil fuel as well as from the renewable energy so if we are replacing this fossil fuel with the renewable energy this can make the electrical vehicle even more greener so the electrical vehicles are designed to replace the fossil fuels with the renewable electricity that is the electricity which is derived from the renewable energy resources so by shifting to a renewable energy resources we can make the electrical vehicle even more green so over time we have reduced the cost of production of electricity as well as the electrical vehicle so this can make the electrical vehicle even more cost effective than the traditional petrol vehicles so the adoption to the electrical vehicles is very essential to make a cleaner energy in the future generations so talking about the hybrid vehicles what are they so hybrid vehicles consist of a gasoline engine along with the electrical motor so here the gasoline engine is powered by a gasoline for example petrol or diesel and this is used as an energy source so the he, here it is also charged with the help of a technique called as regenerative braking so what is regenerative braking it is nothing but usually when we apply brake the energy from the gasoline is released in the form of heat but in this condition the electrical motor will act as a electrical generator and this heat energy is converted into a electricity and stored in the battery and this will be used to run the vehicle so here one source of energy is the gasoline and another is the regenerative braking so here you, you also have to note that we are not giving any external battery power source we are just using the regenerative braking to give the electricity supply but it is not in the case of electrical vehicle for the power supply of the battery we are going to use an external power source that is the external electricity source so this is in case of the hybrid vehicles it consists of petrol engine along with the electric motors to improve the fuel efficiency so here you have to note that we are relying only on the fossil fuel such as the petrol and diesel and this cannot be classified as fully green this is why the writer 
of this article is raising concern about the incentives which are given to hybrid vehicles in par with the electric vehicles. So, the manufacturing manufacturers are promoting the hybrids as equivalent to the electrical vehicles. So, this can extend the life of fossil fuel engine which is concerning to the environment. And another type is the plug-in hybrid vehicles. So, in this type we will have a small battery along with the petrol engine. So, here the battery is charged from an electricity external source and the petrol engine is getting the energy from the gasoline. So, this is in the plug-in resources. So, when we are using electricity, we are going to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases, but with the usage of petrol engine, this is going to nullify the effect. So, it is also not a much greener energy compared to the electrical vehicle totally. So, here you have to understand about the electrical vehicles, what are plug-in hybrids and what are hybrid vehicles. So, Compared to three, electrical vehicles are most green technology in the field. So, what is green washing tactics? So, manufacturers or automakers who are not able to convert the traditional vehicles totally to the electrical vehicles, they are portraying these hybrid vehicles and plug-in vehicles as green vehicles on comparison with the electrical vehicles. So, by greenwashing technique, they are getting the incentives and tax benefits as such of the electrical vehicle. So, this is slowing down the process to transition to the pure electric vehicles and this is called as the greenwashing technique. They are portraying that hybrid vehicles are equally greener technology as that of electrical vehicles and getting all the tax benefits. This is called as the greenwashing technique. So, to promote the electrical vehicles in case of India, the first scheme undertaken by the government of India is the FAME India scheme, which is the faster adoption to the manufacturing of electric and hybrid vehicles. So, first is FAME India scheme, which was launched in the year 2015. So, these are focused mainly to create demand for the electrical vehicles. So, talking about the electrical vehicles, the consumers have two concerns. First is how do they charge their vehicle and what is what will be the cost of this electrical vehicles. So, to deal with this situation, the Fame India 1 scheme was launched where they will give the incentives to the consumers as well as they will provide a charging infrastructure. This is the main objective of this scheme. And second, we have the Fame India scheme which was launched in the year 2019. So, here they expanded on the FAME 1 scheme with a larger budget and their main focus was to improve and facilitate the public transport system and the electrical vehicles be it two wheeler, three wheeler or four wheeler. And the second scheme with respect to promotion of electrical vehicle is the production linked incentive schemes for the advanced chemistry cell. So, the FAME India scheme gave incentives to the consumer, but here the incentives are given to the production people and this scheme was launched in the year 2021 with a budget of about 18,100 crores. So, this scheme aims to promote the manufacturing of advanced battery technologies which are required for the manufacturing of electrical vehicle. So, this will thereby reduce the cost of production of batteries which are required for the electrical vehicles and promote the domestic manufacturing to achieve the Atma Nirbar Bharat which is the self-reliant India. And the third scheme would be National Electric Mobility Mission Plan. So, this has set a target of having 6 to 7 million electric vehicles on the road by the year 2020. So, but now the scheme target has been assessed. The main focus of this scheme is to incentivize the production and the adoption of electrical vehicle. And lastly, we have the battery swapping policy. So, the main concern regarding the electric vehicle is the charging period. It might take quite a some time to charge the vehicles. So, to reduce the time delay to charge, they have introduced this policy. So, in this policy, you can displace or replace the discharged battery with the charged one in the charging station. So, you can replace and swap the discharged with the charged battery to reduce the time delay. 
So, in this discussion, we saw what are electrical vehicles, what are hybrid vehicles. We also saw about what is plug-in electrical vehicles. We saw about the greenwashing techniques used by the automakers to make the hybrid vehicles get all the benefits as such that of the electrical vehicles. And lastly, we finished with what are the initiatives taken by the government to improve the electrical vehicles in India, such as the Fame India Scheme, the National Electrical Mobility Mission Plan and the Battery Swapping Policy. So, with this knowledge in mind, let us see a prelims practice question. In the context of electrical vehicles, road to zero is a key initiative of the which of the following nation? So, the answer would be United Kingdom. So, in UK, they have implemented this is road to zero initiative which is having the objective to reduce the greenhouse gas emission by adopting zero emission vehicles. So, this is the strategy they are talking about. With this, let us conclude the discussion on this article. So, before ending the discussion, I have an important announcement for you all. Shankar IAS Academy is going to start a prelims practice pre-storming test series. This second batch is going to start on October 5th, 2024. You can enroll in this session by clicking in the link given below in the description. We have come to the end of today's video. If you found the video informative, do hit like, give your feedbacks as comment and do not forget to subscribe. Thank you. Have a nice day.